Well, welcome. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. I know uh, it's always uh, fun to have the last talk of the day right before the beer bash. Uh, so, you know, feel free to, you know, if you decide what I'm saying is boring and you just want to go, you know, open a beer, just make sure you got one ready for me when I get there. So uh, I'll be heading there shortly after uh, we get done here. Anyway, so hopefully you're here to hear uh, a little bit about fleet monitoring uh, with IoT, subtitled pets versus uh, cattle. I kind of stole that uh, that subtitle, but I think it's kind of appropriate here. Um, just real briefly, I'm Drew Mosley. I've been doing uh, embedded Linux stuff, I don't know, 15 years and uh, 25 plus years in the embedded space. Uh, currently, I work at Toradex as a solution architect for our Horizon platform, uh, which is an industrial uh, embedded Linux platform with a you know container runtime, over-the-air updates, all those fun kind of things that are kind of uh, necessary for building out these systems today. So briefly what we're going to talk about today, start with the definition of what I mean by fleet monitoring because it's one of those terms that's way overloaded and it means all sorts of different things to different people. So we'll kind of define it a little bit so we're all on the same page. Talk a little bit about you know, what I see as the, architect, the general architecture of fleet monitoring solutions and how it's a little bit different in the Internet of Things. And we'll review some of the options uh, guided primarily by the systems that we investigated for inclusion in our Horizon platform. And then we'll finish up with a proof of concept implementation uh, in, with, a, with a Yocto layer that I've got published. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go through some demo stuff. And uh, hopefully, if you guys are interested, you can take, uh, make, a, make use of the layer that I published. And I should, hopefully, we've got enough time uh, to go through all that. Just real briefly about Toradex, we make hardware. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with us, we make system on modules uh, based uh, primarily these days on IMX uh, 6 and 8 uh, chips. Uh, we have offices over the, all over the world. And just because I always like pictures of uh, fancy hardware, this is our basic product portfolio. We have three, three product lines. Uh, if, you know, if you want more information about that, we've got plenty of time tomorrow to, to, to discuss it. So. Uh, question, how many of you guys have heard the term pets versus cattle? All right, so most of you. So, uh, and, you know, I was do as I was uh, starting to do the research here, uh, it was a term originally coined by a guy named Randy Bias. The link there is a blog article he wrote describing it. It really came from the enterprise computing space where, you know, when, when, when people were starting to, to, to look on servers as essentially... Uh, uh, destruct the uh, things you can just throw away and 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 bring them back up. You know you don't you, you know that's the whole idea. Pets versus cattle. I always uh, am happy to uh, have a reason to put a picture of my dogs up on the screen. Uh, obviously, your pets you treat very differently than cattle. Pets are each individual. You treat them individually. You you feed them what they need based on their medical needs and that kind of thing. Cattle, uh, you know, they're pretty much uh, they're pretty much interchangeable. You can't you can't be uh, uh, doing individual maintenance for every single one of these machines when you've got 10 million of them out in the field. It just doesn't make sense. So uh, it, to modify it a little bit in the IoT space, uh, you know, you can kind of look at the the pet designs as you know your kind of weekend projects, your home automation thing. You know, my, my 3D printer where I've got a Raspberry Pi connected to it. When I need to update it, I SSH into the Raspberry Pi. I, I do the app to get update, you know, and I, I, I put my hands on that one physical machine and I very, very carefully and meticulously keep it up to date. Uh, that doesn't work. It doesn't scale very well when you're looking at uh, large fleets of identical devices. So in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the large fleets of uh, identical devices, you want them to be identical. You want the machine, uh, the binaries that you're installing on them to be identical across all machines so that if one dies, you throw it away, you get a new one, and you, you put it in place. So where does fleet monitoring come in here? Um, so even though they're intended to be identical and replaceable and all that, you still need some mechanism to determine when things are going bad, right? So you're, you have to have some kind of system built in uh, into your software to allow you to monitor the devices, monitor the fleet, get telemetry, that kind of thing, and start to see when you are having issues with certain uh, devices and whether they can be repaired or they just need to be completely replaced. So, and if you have time, I encourage you to read that blog article. It's, act, it's not very long. It's, you know, probably a 10-minute read, but uh, it really goes into a lot of detail and explains a lot of things about the history of the, the, the whole, uh, whole idea. So just a, a little bit more in-depth on what fleet monitoring is. When I started looking at this, I did what I always do, and I go to Wikipedia because, you know, that's the font of all information. 
Uh, the only problem is if you type fleet monitoring into Wikipedia, you're going to get a lot of stuff about uh, maintaining your vehicle fleets, uh, you know, your, your delivery trucks and that kind of thing, and not so much about software fleet monitoring. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we kind of had to kind of make it up a little bit as we go. Um, but in general, it's, uh, you know, the idea is periodic monitoring of some amount of data from all the devices in your fleet. Uh, it could be things like gathering log information, uh, CPU usage, memory usage, things like that, you know, pretty straightforward stuff. Or it could be very application specific stuff depending on, you know, what your needs are for your particular work, uh, uh, workflow. And, you know, some ability to analyze and visualize that data. Uh, and you hear the term a lot, a single pane of glass. The idea is, you know, you've got a web dashboard somewhere that gives you an overall sense of the health of your entire device fleet. And in terms of, uh, you know, just in terms for this, uh, for, for purposes of the proof of concept that I'm doing here, things that are out of scope are things like remote access, remote, remote control, um, and then very use case dependent features, uh, you know, machine learning, AI, big data type stuff. I'm not going into that here, but most of these systems obviously uh, can be expanded into those areas as needed. So, things that you might want to monitor with a fleet monitoring solution. First and foremost, obviously, is device health. Are the devices online? Are they offline? How long have they been up? You know, what's the status of the core services if you're running containers? Are the containers up and running? Which system D services are available? Some thermal, that's always, that's always interesting. Um, the things that, that usually, and that we'll see in the proof of concept, things like CPU and memory utilization, uh, how much flash and network usage you've got, uh, and then, obviously, device configuration, what version of the kernel am I running, that kind of thing. Some other things, uh, device status changes, you know, the system's working, and all of a sudden you get a failed health check, you know, you might want to get some history of, uh, of the information and be able to look back and uh, see if you can figure out what, go, what, uh, what happened. If there was an, you know, an over-the-air update of some kind and it failed, you know, how are you going to be able to troubleshoot that? Logging is always something that uh, will uh, eventually make its way into one of these systems. And then just, uh, I did want to briefly mention some non-functional requirements that uh, if you are uh, looking at some of these solutions that you might want to consider. You know, obviously at this conference, I'm pretty sure we all want it, want it to be open source. Uh, it may, may or may not be a requirement for you. Uh, is there an on-premise version of the server side uh, versus a hosted version? Uh, what kind of performance and, and resource requirements it has both on the client and the server side? Uh, and finally, you know, how easy is it to extend it and integrate it with other services? Because, you know, chances are pretty good any of these systems that you work with, they're, they're, they're not going to meet all your needs, and you're going to have to need some ability via, you know, over APIs or whatnot what to uh, enhance uh, the services and, and integrate with other systems. So the general architecture you see here, and I know everybody's very uh, uh, jealous of my, uh, my, my diagramming skills here, uh, but, uh, you know, the, since most of these systems have come out of the enterprise computing space, you'll see that they're able to take input from a lot of different sources. You know, SNMP is, is a big one. Uh, you know, local files or, you know, just uh, uh, items that are, are generated on the device itself. Cloud APIs, you'll see a lot of off-board inputs that are pulled into the systems. You'll see onboard inputs where you're just pulling telemetry from the device itself. Then there's some, some concept of filtering generally in each of these systems. You might be filtering on the device to just limit the amount of data you're sending back. There might be some kind of filtering you know, off the device, say, in an edge, edge node somewhere. Um, and then an, an important component to most of these systems is the ability to have multiple output uh, sources. So in the proof of concept we're doing here, we actually are using uh, the, the Kibana uh, data visualization framework, but uh, you could also send it uh, to, to other outputs. Uh, you know, our, our Tryzen platform has, takes in some of this data and we're able to display it there, but uh, you know, it may, may or may not have everything you need. So the ability to actually uh, get into the system and be able to, to have multiple output streams is very important. Now, how is this different from the uh, IoT architecture? Uh, generally speaking, at least for the kinds of designs we work with, you know, it's, it's, it's much more homogenous, right? All the devices are identical or within a couple of, you know, maybe two, maybe three device personalities. You don't have near the, the uh, flexibility that you would have in, say, an enterprise, uh, big enterprise uh, deployment. And in most cases, you're going to see that, um, the inputs are, are much more limited. You're not going to be, generally speaking, pulling SNMP data from a, uh, 
you know, a, a, a consumer uh, IoT device that uh, you buy at the, you know, at, at the local Best Buy and plug into the environment. Normally, uh, with, with what we see in IoT uh, deployments here, the de all the d data that is coming into the system is coming from the devices themselves. They're not really reaching out and uh, uh, interrogating the local environment to send information back. So it's a little bit simpler in that perspective. You still want the ability to have filtering uh, from within the device as well as the multiple output streams. It's pretty important to be able to do that. So a couple of the options that we looked at, uh, just want to quickly, uh, briefly mention them here. Uh, these are the ones that, uh, that we looked at and pretty quickly decided they were not uh, a great solution for IoT. Primarily for all of these, it was due to their uh, on-device footprints. They're all very large systems designed for you know, big iron uh, systems where you got plenty of uh, space uh, and, and memory and that kind of thing. Uh, the first one that we looked at was one called Nagios Chi. Uh, it's a very full-featured system. It does uh, use a lot of SNMP. There's also custom agents. Um, it is a uh, hybrid uh, between open source and commercial licensing. The demo server, I've got the link there. You can actually log in and uh, you, you can kind of get an idea of how much uh, functionality is available in this system. Uh, Yakto recipes do exist, so it is feasible. You could actually run this in an IoT system built on a, on a Yakto device, but it's uh, going to take quite a bit of uh, RAM and flash to be able to do anything with it. Similarly, Elastic Stash, uh, if you haven't heard of this one, it's pretty common. Uh, Elastic Search, Log Stash, and Kibana are the three main components of it. Uh, it has a lot of input plugins. You see a couple listed here. It has both on-prem and hosted options. Uh, it is dual licensed under Apache. It does have a relatively large device footprint. They do have a, something that's relatively new called Beats. Uh, that I didn't really spend a whole lot of time researching, but the idea is it's supposed to reduce the on-device uh, footprint uh, with, with uh, smaller agents and that kind of thing. Um, and we are actually using, uh, in the proof of concept here, we're using the Kibana portion of this uh, for the proof of concept that's actually running on the server side, so the fact that it uh, takes a, a decent amount of uh, memory and, and disk space is not as big a deal. And, and one of the things I wanted to mention about this is when I started the research here, I kind of assumed there would be client-side solutions and server-side solutions. But in most cases, it's really kind of an integrated thing. You'll find, you know, Elastic Stack, uh, the Elastic Search with Logstash and Kibana. They're kind of kind of a combination. They all have APIs, so you can mix and match as uh, as you need. But uh, for the most part, these systems are uh, fairly full end-to-end uh, -end client server solutions. Um, another one I'm sure we've all heard of is Datadog. Uh, they're the only ones that specifically mention IoT monitoring uh, on, the, on their website that I could find. I've got the link there. Uh, exactly what it means, I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't, we didn't spend a whole lot of time with it. Zabbix, uh, the first bullet here, that's actually their description of their system. Obviously, enterprise class. Uh, it wasn't really terribly interesting from, uh, from our perspective. Uh, but it is fully open source. Another one that there are Yocto recipes for. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, take, that, uh, <laughs> take that as you will. You might be able to make use of that in your design. Uh, and the last one we looked at is Splunk. Uh, they're the, quote, data to everything platform powering security, IT, and DevOps. A lot of words in there. It's a very big, very heavy solution that can do a lot of stuff, but it was way overkill for our needs. So I seem to have reordered my slides here. <laughs> So this was supposed to be the next slide. So another, a couple other options we looked at, one Telegraph and InfluxDB. I know I spoke to some of the Influx folks uh, today. Uh, th this uh, is, uh, there is both on-prem and hosted, MIT licensed. It is written in Golang, which is nice, because that means it compiles down to a single binary, no external dependencies, makes it very easy to figure out what you've got to put on your device to actually get this thing working. But 110 mega flash is uh, quite a bit when some of our uh, systems on modules only have 256 megs of flash on board, so it's kind of hard to justify half of your flash for just, the, for, for just this uh, fleet monitoring solution. Uh, again, Yocto recipes exist here, so uh, this is actually usable in, in some of the larger systems. And the final uh, one that we investigated is called FluentBit or FluentD. Um, it's uh, open source Apache. It is part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is good. We all like that. There's really two options here. There's, there's FluentD, uh, which is the, the, the smaller of the two. It's written in C and Rust. Uh, it's only got, or sorry, this is the bigger of the two. It's written in C and Rust. You see it's got a lot, lot of output and input plugins. 
It does depend on Ruby gems, which makes it take up quite, you know, a little bit more space in the, in the system just due to all the, the transitive dependencies and that kind of thing that get pulled in. It takes up about 40 megs of flash. Uh, the, then there's also the Fluent Bit client, which was specifically written uh, in C and designed to be small uh, for these kind of deployments. Uh, it's a lot less uh, choice of input and output plugins, but realistically not that big a deal since uh, you know, we're not uh, trying to be as flexible as a, a full enterprise class system. Uh, it doesn't have any external dependencies, which makes it easy. Uh, three megs of flash, 650K RAM, and obviously uh, Yocto recipes exist. So since I got my slides all out of order, we'll jump back here. I kind of gave the, uh, I kind of buried the lead here. So we ended up choosing Fluent Bit for our solution uh, with a custom output plugin uh, that uh, basically uh, sends all the data back to our server side uh, over in-band JSON. Uh, we do have, at the moment, we're actually pulling in more data than we're displaying, and eventually we'll have uh, the ability to, uh, over the, the API, to actually pull the extra data out and do whatever post-processing you need. Uh, but since, since you can actually choose multiple output plugins for this thing, uh, you, don't, you could actually, if, if the data that we're pulling back to our server side in our solution isn't enough, you could actually deliver it straight out to uh, whatever, uh, whatever visualization solution you have. And that's exactly what we'll be implementing here uh, in just a moment. So what do we have uh, in terms of the proof of concept? Uh, we've got an, a custom distro and a Yocto image in a public Git repo that's just hosted on my GitHub. It's uh, pretty straightforward. It adds Fluent Bit and uh, the basic configuration of it. Uh, delivers data uh, to an Elasticsearch instance, and which is uh, able to be visualized in Kibana. It's specifically not, uh, this proof of concept is specifically designed not to be a Terizon implementation, but it's very simple, similar to what we have implemented in our Terizon solution. And I also, as part of the, uh, the, the, the Git repository, I have a Docker setup to allow you to uh, actually easily run the server, which we'll look at here in a second. So image recipe, for those that are familiar with Yocto, uh, Yocto metadata, you see how simple this is. Uh, all we're doing is taking uh, the base core image and we're adding one recipe to it. Uh, <laughs> so it's pretty straightforward to, to use. Um, so in terms of how we've modified the Fluent Bit recipe, we've actually got a number of uh, uh, custom config files here. Uh, you see the highlighted line there. That's the one configuration point you'll need to do if you're wanting to, to replicate this environment. You just specify that fleet server URI uh, in your config file. Uh, for, my, for my setup, I just use the IP address of the machine that I happen to be running. Uh, and it's uh, pretty straightforward. This is the Docker Compose file uh, that I use for the server side. And you see that it defines uh, two services. One is Elasticsearch. That's the actual database, the time series database that uh, the Fluent Bit agent is sending the data to. Um, and then there's the Kibana instance, which is the visualization as well as the web front end. And it's communicating uh, uh, with, with the Elasticsearch back end and pulling the data and, and being able to display it. And just in terms of how you use it, the, the, here's the instructions here. You know, you just add, the, this, this setup assumes that uh, you have a working Yocto config for some piece of hardware, doesn't really matter what. Um, and then you just add the, extra, the one extra layer uh, to your system, specify that fleet server URI in your, your configuration, and then build uh, the custom, uh, that custom image that I generated. And in terms of the setup uh, for the server, it's pretty straightforward. Just run a single Docker Compose command. Any system that happens to be uh, able to run Docker containers can run this thing pretty straightforwardly. So the, you know, they say uh, if, if, you're, uh, in, if your uh, material isn't terribly interesting, just you know, beef it up with some colors. So I figured uh, you know, before we get into the demo, we'll uh, uh, get a nice uh, cloudy colored image here. So let's take a look here real quick at the demo. Um, so we're on our server here. You see that this is actually uh, running on my machine back in my home network. Uh, I've got two, got the two services uh, that, you, that you would have expected here. I happen to have uh, two Kimu instances running, and we see that it periodically uh, is, is collecting that information out of the configuration file and sending it back up to the server. So real quickly, let's take a look at some of these config files. So these are just text files that get added to the configuration and delivered. Um, so if we want to take a look at say, the input CPU, this is where 
uh, we're, we're delivering information about CPU usage and that kind of thing. Uh, the the uh, host address is the, the server that it's going to. Uh, we're adding a little bit in the filter information. Uh, we're, we're matching anything about the CPU, but then I'm adding the host name uh, in as one of the fields of each of the records. Just gives us the ability uh, in the, the, the Kibana interface to actually say, okay, which system is, is, is uh, producing this particular information. So with that, we've got our two systems here, and let's jump over here. So, um, so this is uh, the, the the this will go right along with my uh, mad diagramming skill skills, also my uh, U, UI UX expertise here in this lovely interface. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, I've got uh, a single visualization here based on uh, CPU usage. Uh, it's running, pulling it out every minute or so. Let's go ahead and maximize this so we can see. We'll go ahead and refresh, see if it's able to pull in new data. And if the demo gods are with me, we'll see this moving. And you see uh, it hasn't changed a whole lot. But just to make it interesting, we can come back over here and we can run our stress test. Well, I guess that's... So we will run a 30 second stress test. And so now we should, with any luck, see the CPU usage spike just as expected. So, um, you know, obviously uh, this isn't uh, the most interesting display in the world, but uh, we'll let that run for a second. And we can also just, uh, so uh, we are uh, aware of how we can add to this. We'll go ahead and create another uh, visualization. Uh, in this case, we'll take a look at memory, u use, memory usage. So in here, we're selecting anything that's uh, got this board underscore star uh, regex. Uh, that's how uh, Fluent Bit sends the information. So now we come down here and say, what fields are we interested in? So we'll go ahead and say memory usage. We're going to just grab this and drop it here. So now we're uh, looking at uh, a bar vertical stacked, which since they're independent devices, I don't really want it stacked. I'm just going to change it to a regular vertical bar. And then the other thing I want to do, I want to group it uh, by the host name. So this is how we're able to um, see uh, the, the, the devices up against each other. So we'll go ahead and select that. And we uh, save this. And now we have added to our visualization. And similarly, uh, if we... I, I believe, if I remember the uh, syntax right, oh, let's see. What's that? <laughs> I'm just just learning this new the the stress test app, but. Uh, So now we're starting to see some more memory usage. So you know that kind of gives you the idea. Kibana, I, I did want to bring this up. Uh, Kibana, there's a lot of very interesting visualizations out there. I found this uh, this uh, blog post, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, these are supposed to be live uh, visualizations, but uh, I clicked through a lot of them and they didn't actually seem to have any data in them. So the screenshots uh, give you a better sense of some of the things you can do. So if you're just using Kibana uh, to visualize this data, this is actually a really good, uh, good site to kind of give you an idea of some of the different things you can look at. I I think the, the, uh, when I looked at this earlier today, this was actually pulling live data from uh, a Google Cloud compute uh, situation, uh, somebody's Google Cloud uh, environment. So there's a lot of different things you can do directly with this. And obviously, you can embed these graphs in, a, in, in other systems and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of uh, very useful information in there. And I think with that, We've got some time for questions before beer, if I can figure out why this is not letting me maximize my uh, screen. So, any questions? Kevin. So, I noticed Bob stack is not in this particular stack. Does Elastic have a plugin that already knows how to parse fluent data? Uh, evidently so. <laughs> 
I, I'm not, I, you know, I, I didn't d dig, you know, I, I didn't dig too much into the server side uh, of things. You know, FluentBit is very, it, it, you know, the recipe is already there, uh, and, and then those configuration files uh, send, send data over in a format that Kibana was able to, to, to view directly. Uh, n not today, uh, you know. Obviously, in this proof of concept, we're definitely not. But you know, uh, the, the, you know, the question is with Logstash. You know, you can obviously do a lot more than we're doing here. And you know, are we able to do uh, pull things like system D logs and D messages and things like that? Um, it's not something that we have implemented in Horizon. It's not something I have implemented in in here. But that certainly uh, can be done as part of this. Uh, you know, once you've got the the uh, flow uh, of data between the systems, then then getting uh, you know getting adding more data to it is 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 easy to do. Right. When I played with it for logging data, I, I mean, I, I didn't find, I mean, I'm not good with Kibana either, but I didn't find like really obvious things to do with, with actually logging and filtering logs and looking for keywords and pattern matching and stuff like that. And, yeah, yeah, and that's what exactly what Logstash is intended to provide from, uh, you know, the research I've done on it. Um, you know, it, it's more, you know, less time series data and more just, you know, log searching, sorting and filtering and that kind of thing. There, and there are lots of solutions for that, and that's certainly, that certainly would be, the, you know, kind of the next step for enhancing something like this, you know, it, it, when you're uh, implementing that in your system. And I know, you know, Mender, Mender has, uh, is working on implementing something like that. We're working on implementing something like that, but uh, at the moment, it's uh, it's early days. We don't know exactly what it's going to end up looking like. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, you know, how, what, what, what can you do to respond to uh, situations that are, are detected by, by this? And th there are certainly uh, additional packages that you can integrate with, you know, API access between the systems. You can always do that. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what we're going to implement with Horizon, I'm sure there will be some, uh, you know, some sense of being able to respond to these things. For, for the purposes of what I was doing here, it was really about the visualization, so I wasn't trying to implement something like that. But yeah, certainly you could do that, right? Once you have the data, the, the, the next question becomes, you know, what are you going to do with it at that point? Right. So the question is, you know, what is, what's the server side component of FluentBit? And in this case, it's the the Elasticsearch database, right? We're sending the data directly to uh, the the Elasticsearch stack uh, running on the server side. Um, and you know, I I would assume you can send it to just about any database uh, with an appropriate output plugin and, and filtering and that kind of thing. So um, you know, they 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 are they work together well, but they're not necessary. It's not necessarily required that they that they go together. There are lots of options that you can plug and play with. Okay, so for for uh, the the recording, the comment was that it, I, in a lot of cases, FluentBit is actually running on the server side, and then the data is being delivered there, and it can be then delivered onto other uh, other containers or other servers or that kind of thing. So that's I guess that's where the the, the historical uh, uh, where where FluentBit came from. But you know, for obviously for the IoT space, uh, we're more interested in it running as a client side daemon uh, on the the uh, devices in the field. 
All right, any other questions? Einstein. Yeah, so in terms of the way we're setting it up, you know, the metrics that you get, uh, they, they're anything basically that you can pull out of the system. So, you know, if we take a look at these configuration files, right, we've got information about, uh, let's see what's in the, you know, about networking. And, and these things are all kind of predefined as part of Fluent Bit, so we're not actually defining anything custom here. We're just pulling stock telemetry that is you know generic to all systems, uh, but you know you could write custom input plugins that 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 uh, you know would pull you know application specific information or and that kind of thing. And of course you know what Kevin was talking about in terms of the logging, uh, you know that 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 opens up a lot more uh, flexibility for you as well. Yeah, fair enough. That's a good point. Yeah, the, the, the point is, yeah, so we've got the name here, ES, so instead of uh, uh, Kibana being able to read the fluent bit data, we're actually using an Elastic Stack output uh, plugin that's specific for Elastic Stack. Yeah, absolutely. All right, very good. Any other questions? How do we do on time? So we, we're a little bit early, so there's a, you know, time for more beer. All right, guys, thanks for coming out.